Welcome to another episode of our mini podcast, I Built a Company That Makes a Difference by B1. Here, we talk to founders of sustainable businesses to get their takes on how and why they started their companies and the lessons that they've learned along the way. Today, I'm joined by Hadley Pollitt, the founder, designer, and CEO of Hadley Pollitt, a clothing, jewelry, and accessories brand created to uplift women worldwide. And if you haven't been to the Hadley Pollitt website yet, it is full of absolutely stunning, colorful, unique, amazing creations from belts to handbags to jewelry, 80% made by female artisans and entrepreneurs from around the world. So Hadley, welcome to the podcast. I'm so looking forward to hearing about this world that you've created. Well, thank you for having me. Um, I, I love being on podcasts like yours and I love telling my story. So I really appreciate it. Wonderful. I'm so excited to get into this conversation then. Can you just start by telling us a little bit about yourself and about your background? Sure. So I started my company um, right after 9-11. My mom's third husband was in the second tower that went down. And so I lost somebody very close to me. Um, and during that time, I actually was working in public relations, <laughs> doing consulting work. Um, I was taking also taking classes at Rhode Island School of Design and and helping and running back and forth from from um, Boston and Rhode Island to New York City or the New York City area to help my mom. I um, I pivoted my entire life because when you lose somebody, it's it's not unlike COVID or what you're seeing right now around the world with all these terrible tragedies you know, when you lose somebody like that, you really realize, um, how fragile life is. And if you're doing something that you don't like doing, <laughs> now's the time to change. <laughs> so I was taking classes at Rhode Island school of design, and I had, um, an idea for a pregnancy line that was modular actually. And, um, one of the accessories that went with the pregnancy line was a belt. Cause I thought, well, early on in your pregnancy, maybe you could um, use a belt to accessorize the different clothing. And I went out, um, to a friend's birthday party in Boston wearing this belt, which wasn't even sewn. It was like a piece of trim wrapped around a buckle. And five people asked me, where did you get your belt? We were waiting basically for our table. And I immediately was like, how much will you pay for the belt? <laughs> <laughs> So I quickly had, you know, made 12 belts up, decided to make them reversible and um, went to my two favorite stores. And those two stores in Boston started to carry my line. And then they referred me to two more stores. And then all those stores, all the stores have friends um, in the industry. So they started referring me to other people. And I got myself into 50 stores um, by myself. And then somebody on the beach <laughs> um, on Martha's Vineyard referred me to this woman. Her name is Cynthia O'Connor and she had launched Kate Spade. And she um, took a look at my website, which this was 2003. So it was kind of unusual to be in stores and have a website, but I had decided that we, we were gonna do that. We were new and I wasn't gonna listen to their fear around having a website. So she took a look at my site and without even meeting me, she faxed me a contract. <laughs> she faxed you a contract. It was like, yeah. So that's way back when, right? It wasn't via email and said, wow. I don't even need to meet you. I want your line. Um, she was a wholesale rep at the time. And she took us into, you know, Saks Fifth Avenue, um, Neiman's, Nordstrom, all a lot of department stores and, and small specialty stores around the world. And and since then, the business has changed dramatically. I mean, it's been 20 years. So, um, you know, we've morphed and changed <laughs> into what we are today, which is, um, you know, very, very focused on women working and economic empowerment for women, working with artisans and women around the world um, and creating highly specialized products. So these are not products that you would see on Amazon or in big box retailers, there's, um, I am of the belief there's a lot of sameness in the world right now. So we are anything but the same. <laughs> yeah. Oh and how we do things and also, yeah. And the products that we create. Yeah. Well, th this, 
there's so much just in this, how you got started. So can you describe for us what your first belt looked like? Well, it's actually, I, I think there's a version of it, maybe in a different color on our site. It's our zinnia belt. And the ah. flower, flower in our logo is derived from that belt. Um, and it's a textile that, um, that I designed, um, uh, specifically, you know, for the brand that it just turned out it was our best selling belt. So that's why we put the flower in the logo a little bit later. <laughs> um, but it's, that's, there are women that collect them. So they're every now and then I'll come across somebody who has a lot of them in their closet. <laughs> Um, and so those belts have really been our bread and butter since day one and it's reversible. It has a flower on it that looks very much like the flower of life in Peru, or, um, it looks very Japanese, very German. It kind of has this cross-cultural, um, symbolism. So it really appeals to a lot of different cultures. Um, and I think it's because it's, um, it's a very simple, but really beautiful flower and it really resonates with a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Okay. So you just made the belt because you were going to an event, a baby shower, right? A baby shower. I was going to somebody's birthday party, a birthday like, party. <laughs> yeah. And so you just made the belt up for yourself and you had requests like in the restaurant on the street. How do yes. you get this belt? Where did you get this belt? And that's how you launched your business. That is the, how the, the idea that what I had created was a good idea came to life. So it was a tortoise it's, and they're still on our site. It's a tortoise buckle with a very flowery, um, trim and it's a jacquard trim. They're made on old looms, old jacquard looms from like the 1800s. Um, I think the looms put out like maybe 25 meters a day. Wow. <laughs> um, so yeah. And at the time, I think it kind of harked back to some designs that were from maybe the early seventies. Um, but everybody was wearing these ribbon belts that were striped with metal buckles. And so it was kind of like, it was very different than what you were seeing in the market. Um, we did have some stores say to us, Oh, we want the metal buckle. And I just was like, no, that's not the point. The point of this is that it's rebellious <laughs> and that it's different. And the women that wear our stuff now and, and that we work with, they understand that <laughs> very much so <laughs> that, you know, you're wearing this to stand out and not to um, conform. So that, okay. I've got so many questions now just from this intro. So <laughs> one of my questions for later on was what, if you can't, I mean, it's tough. But when you work in e-commerce or when you work in, in fashion, could you describe for us, if possible, I know it's it's tough to generalize, who is a um, typical buyer for Hadley Pollitt stuff? Who Who is the, what kind of woman, you know, who, who have you discovered? Well, what I've discovered is that sort of my essence comes through the products. I have this ability and have had this ability since I was really little. My mom used to always say to me, you always find the weird ones for your <laughs> friends, you know? <laughs> and it's because I love people who are just themselves. Like I really, really love people who are themselves. So it does not matter to me um, where you're from, you know, who, who your parents are, what, what school you went to. None of that matters to me. What matters to me is that you are expressing yourself wholeheartedly because you are really in alignment if you're doing that. And I've known that ever since I was very little. And so what we find is that the women that wear our things, they, they, they understand that. So I'll meet a woman that's, you know, a total hippie. And she'll say to me, this is just the most flower child belt. <laughs> and then I'll crack up a, a magazine and there'll be an African-American man who's a jazz player wearing the belt. And then oh, that's awesome. I'll, I'll land myself. You know, I come from a very preppy area of Connecticut and there'll be, you know, a really preppy woman who's been wearing every belt with, you know, matching sandals her whole life. <laughs> So the beauty in that is that, um, you know, 
the women that wear our stuff, they see themselves in it. And they also see it as a conduit through which they can express themselves. Oh, that's and really nice. That's the most important thing to me. I don't, I really don't, you know, I, I don't pigeonhole into kind of one market. And if you, for our audience, I encourage everybody to go, to go, to go visit the website, because as soon as you're there, it, you are struck by, well, wow, it looks like each one of these creations is, is totally unique, special. And it, it comes across like this is handmade, very special. You know, it looks like one of a kind each, each one of the things I was really getting deep into the handbags. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah. So some of the bags are made with an atelier, um, out of Southeast Asia and it's mm. female. Usually how I work with them is I'll bring some of the fabrics that I've designed and then we'll start to play around. How yeah. did you get in contact with them? How did you discover them? Um, so, uh, I found them when I was traveling. Oh. Yeah. So a lot of the, um, a lot of the designers that we work with, we will work with government, um, uh, either different governments, like we've worked with the Peruvian government to work with designers in Peru, or we'll just get referred to them. Yeah. Okay. And how yeah. many different, um, I know they're not all artisans, some of entrepreneurs, factory owners, et cetera, how many uh, different um, groups are you working with? Oh gosh. Um, probably, I don't even know each season. It, it might be a little bit different, you know, oh, we right. have four, our core factories that we work with. And I'd say those are may, range anywhere from maybe 10 to 20. That's and then lot. We have other artisan groups that we, that we work with too, depending on where we think the, the, um, you know, the, where, where we think the market is going to respond. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. So it really, okay. just, yeah. <laughs> Can we dive a little bit into that first, let's say the first three years of the business. And from the first, when you started, you said, okay, you know, I'm going to commercialize this um, until you were able to take the, you know, do that full time. Was that immediate or did that, was that a gradual move? It was gradual. I, um, I was consulting in public relations. So I had two customers, two clients that I was working with and that supported my business. Also, I was, I had a very quick marriage. Um, nine 11 made it very clear to me that I was not in the right marriage also, and that I had made a mistake. And so I took my engagement ring <laughs> and funded my business with it. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> so it was, it was twofold. It was like, I had this public relations. I think I, it was maybe a six month overlap with my mm -hmm. clients there. And then I had this one moment where I realized I have to buy a lot of fabric to create, to meet the demand. And that's when the ring just went right back. To right. You had a, a, a piece jeweler. of a capital right there that you yeah. could get your business off the like, ground. I've, taken it to the jeweler and here we go. And, you know, I think I got half of what we paid for it, but it didn't matter to me at the mm -hmm. value at that time was just, let's grow the business. Yeah. Right. And just, can you walk us through how you got, like, what did, was the conversation like when you entered your first uh, store and you secure that first distribution? Can you walk us through like, I'm sure a, a lot of folks on listening to the podcast, they're, they would love to do something similar, securing your first distribution channel. Um, so how did you, what did, was it like? Were you, were you, what was your state of mind and how did it go? Um, okay. So I had this little basket, this hand painted basket, and it looked like the fabrics it had like a lid on it and it looked like the fabrics that we designed. So I folded up the 12 belts into the basket and I wore a belt into the store. Now the store owner definitely knew me because I frequented the store. She had a store in Boston and a store in Nantucket. And, um, so she knew me and her manager knew me too, because I, you know, when you're in fashion, you always like to poke around and shop. Even if you're not buying, you want to see what's going on and what people are making and how they're making it. And, so even though I wasn't officially in fashion yet, I, I had that bug in me, 
so I would always pop by the store when I was in Boston. So I went into the store and I had my belt on one of my belts on actually the one that was the bestseller. And, um, I was, you know, I really believe in wearing what you, what you are, you know, using and wearing what you create. So, um, yeah, so I had a belt on and immediately the manager was like, where did you get that? (laughs) Did you go in with the intention of being like, I'd like to secure placement here, or were you just happened to be in there with your stuff? I did. I went in there with a basket of belts, but she didn't know what was in the basket. And I was wearing the belt and she said, where, what, where, where is that from? And I said, well, that's what I'm doing. <laughs> and so I just opened the basket and showed them to her. So there were two stores in Boston like that. One was owned by like an, a girl that I knew since childhood, but I was still nervous to of talk to her. Um, and the other one was this one that had a store in Nantucket that I thought was important because, um, you know, a a lot of people go to Nantucket in the summer and they, a lot of people shopped that store. So if you shop that store a lot, you would, you know, you would see our stuff. So they both quickly bought, they each bought, I don't even know. I think I said, oh, my minimum is, it should be a lot higher than this now. But at the time I was like, just buy 12. So did they, you, was that like off the top of your head or had you done yes. a bit of re, just off the top of your head? Yeah. Just by 12. So they bought, but they sold out really quickly. So right. each of them sold out within a week. And oh. with that, it just started the ball rolling and they, you know, it's not, it's, it's unusual for that to happen. So they sold out very quickly. And then it was just like, okay, now we, we got to go. <laughs> And so at that first store, actually, I met a girl who had worked with Nanette Lepore and she started working hourly with me. I said to her, I need help. You know, I don't, I don't know what I'm doing. Right. (laughs) And she had gone to FIT and worked with Nanette Lepore and she really, um, you know, in design, I mean, she was in in design and Nanette Lepore, which is another American brand. And, and she really, um, you know, helped me navigate where to go. I also did a lot of, a lot of talking to people and just trying to, you know, find out how to do this. (laughs) So I had a friend whose mother-in-law owned Vera. um, She founded Vera Bradley and she sat down with me and um, gave me carte blanche to her production department. So they told me where to get things made, how to get things made. You know, she really uh, was not a gatekeeper in terms of she's a, a helper. And I think that's very important as a woman to not be a gatekeeper. There is no competition. People always ask me, who's your competition? And I'm like, I don't see it as competition. I don't even like, it doesn't even cross my mind. <laughs> so that's an interesting concept for lots of different reasons. One, just very practically, how did you think about pricing? Because your creations are very, very unique at the time. As you said, this was not like a standard belt that everybody was wearing. How did you think about pricing? Um, so for pricing, we just took a look. Actually, I talked to a lot of people in the industry as to how things were priced. And then we also, they were very expensive to have made initially, like ridiculously expensive, which always happens, you know, it's like even with electronics, right? The first thing invented, it is always like $10,000. And then 10 years later, it's, you know, a lot less expensive. It's what is it like 500 or something? So, um, yeah. So, you know, we took a look at, at the cost, but we also took a look at where we thought the market would yield. And it was a combination of the two. And I did ask a lot of people, their advice in the industry. Like, where do you think? And so we landed on this belt is going to be $98 at retail. And it doesn't matter what it costs right now. And at the time I was taking a bath on what it costs to make, but very quickly we figured out how to make it so that it was making money. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. Okay. And just going back to the last thing that you said about uh, getting a lot of support and, and from women and not being a gatekeeper to information. Do you think that was something that was, it was just serendipitous. This was a timing or, or maybe both. Did you ask a lot of times when I talk to female entrepreneurs, one of their regrets um, is that they didn't take time or they were not bold enough or brave enough to just ask 
to say, can you help me? Or I, I'd like to understand this, or I don't know this, can you teach this to me? So what was in the at the beginning of your business when you were running into some folks who were women who were really helping you out and learning the business, what was it like for you? I wasn't afraid to ask, but I also came from a background of working in public relations where I was pitching media who Mm. sometimes didn't want to hear from me. Right. Mm -hmm. So you get, I had been in that industry for a really long time and you get used to hearing the word no. And so I think my background, you know, that the marketing side of things, the branding and marketing and understanding that the look and feel of the brand had to be a certain way and that I did have to ask. And even if I got a no, it wasn't a failure. It was just not the right person. Um, All of that was already woven together in my background. So for me, it was really just the how to get it made Mm -hmm. (laughs) and getting to know the industry, like the other side of the industry, not the marketing side of the industry, but the other side of the industry. How do I get it made? Um, How do I learn how to design things that are more sophisticated than, you know, and things like that. And maybe that's an easier ask. I I don't know, but um, a lot of people offered information to me that helped. And and to this day, I mean, the other day I had leftover, some leftover leather and um, some fabrics that weren't fabrics that, that were copyrighted by us. And I gave them to a girl that I met at the local coffee shop who has a belt business. <laughs> and I said, well, here, you know, we're not using these. And I just took four bins of stuff over to her. And she said, you just started my business. Oh my gosh. That's amazing. And I was like, well, I had so many people that did kind things to me. I don't need these. I'm not using them. I would rather you take them and, you know, propel this forward. Yeah. Yeah. I love that notion of Actually, you're not going head to head and competing with with anybody. There's there's space to for everyone to move in this universe. Yeah, if you're in your purpose, there's space for you. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I like that a lot. So then, if you look back at that again at the that first let's say five years, um, what are some things that you think? Okay, if I were to advise somebody today setting up a similar business, what are some things that you would have done differently had you known? Um, I probably, let's see, what would I have done different? I probably would have stood in my power a little bit more in the sense of this is my company. You know, there were times where I think I hired consultants that, you know, they didn't know any more than I did, but I felt like I needed help. Um, and so I had some bum consultants along the way. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, you know, there are things, there are moments like that where you feel like, how am I doing this? You know, like I'm in a new industry and you figure it out. And if you're meant to be doing it, it just, you know, sometimes it comes so naturally. It's like, I, it came so naturally to me. I thought like, how's this happening? You know, mm. there's like something wrong, right? With me. And, um, or, you know, there's gotta be some catch. So I think, um, if things are happening very naturally and moving and flowing very quickly, roll with it and understand that that's your power. Right. That's awesome. Okay. So over the last 20 years that you've been building this, uh, this business, what are some, I mean, we talk about always on this podcast, some major ups and downs or pivots or things that, you know, life events uh, that have just, you know, shaped the business in a different direction. A lot of times that was COVID, especially for e-commerce businesses. Um, Over the last 20 years, what are some events or have there been any events that have really kind of pivoted the business or shaped it differently or maybe even almost derailed? So we had a Chinese factory that shipped us like tens of thousands of product that was faulty. Ooh. And at the same time, this was in the beginning. This was really, really early on, probably like, I don't know, maybe eight years in. And 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 it's so funny because now I see a lot of companies saying, I want to sell a million pair pairs of shoes. And I'm like, no, you don't. <laughs> no, you don't. 
and it's not good for the environment. It's not good for, you know, but so at the same time that this Chinese factory and, you know, we were arguing with them <laughs> and sending them legal letters and, and all this stuff. Um, somebody from the Peruvian government reached out to me and said, you know, we really want to work with you and we want you to work with artisans in Peru. And I remember at the time thinking, I'm having such a hard time, this factory in China. And yet out of the blue, out of the blue, this man comes to Boston to meet with me and shows me incredible work by these artisans. And so not unlike pivoting out of my PR career into fashion, I pivoted then and said, you know, I'm, we're about, um, working with artisans. This is, and when I went to Peru for the first time, I had a translator that was, um, taking me around to meet with all these artisans. And I was so enthralled that after day one, she said to me, maybe you can like set a plan because you were walking in circles. <laughs> <laughs> But I was really in my purpose. I mean, even like I was exhausted. The picture I posted on Facebook, I thought I had like bags under my eyes and all these people were saying, you look so beautiful. And I thought, oh my God, I took an overnight flight. I, you know, <laughs> I got here. Clearly something else is happening in this photo, which is I'm really, you know, like the universe just corrected where I was going. And now I'm really standing in my purpose. And so the best time for me is when we're working, you know, when I'm working one-on-one -on -one with artisans on different um, projects, I love it. Like I love promoting them. I love hearing their stories. I love hearing the stories of the women, how they got to where they, you know, where they were and, and how they're doing what they're doing, how we can help them the effect that it has on their community. So that was a major pivot for me. Yeah. And for those of us who don't work in um, apparel or in the same industry, how big of a deal is it to do a pivot like this where you take, you think, okay, I'm working with one manufacturer. It's difficult. I'm going to actually lift and change my business, my manufacturing to a whole other part of the world to, like how big of it just just you know give it's us an idea huge. for those of us yeah that's that's it's what I was huge. getting at and and um a lot of people had to do that during COVID right like everybody's like I can't get anything out of China and I remember thinking well I mean I had this experience a long time ago right and um even during that time I had a lot of people call me and say we know you do a lot of manufacturing that's not in China what do you do you know, and I told them, you know, we work with a lot of different government entities around the world. You know, I'll, we still work with a lot of, of government entities in, in governments in um, Southeast Asia, in India, we do work in South America, Mexico, you know, you name it. We just had a lot of trouble with China. <laughs> we were getting knocked off all over the place because we were working there, which is, you know, I think a problem for a lot of people now. I, I saw my stuff in Chinatown in, in, um, New York city, really bad version of it. Yes. A really terrible. Oh. Bit. And it was awful, you know, but people were having that problem during COVID. And I remember, th you know, during that time thinking, Oh, I know how hard this is. I mean, it is very difficult. You're starting over again, basically. So that big risk. <laughs> It takes probably, you know, it takes time to get the products right. And so there is some training that goes back and forth with the quality and the, you know, usually they don't nail it on the first try. Right. right? Yeah. So there's some education and some training and some, yeah. Okay. So this was a, this was a big pivot for you. This was a pretty big risk. It was, yeah, it was a big pivot. Yeah. I mean, we're right now, actually, we're pivoting our business a little bit because I don't, I don't like the model in the fashion industry that promotes selling a million shoes or selling a million of anything, because what it's doing is it's causing high minimums, you know, landfills to overflow flow, all these problems. And, you know, the factories, the bigger factories are asking you, you know, oh, you need, you need to make 500 of these. Well, 300 of them 
might end up in landfills Mm. because everybody's buying a bunch of crap. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, they're buying things that that are cheap, that are not well-made and they're ending up in landfills. And so, you know, we don't do that. We just don't do that. (laughs) Right. Yeah. So, and then you also have, you know, department stores that take discount, dis, you know, that take chargebacks. And so the whole model is a little skewed right now um, against d- designers. And our model is not. <laughs> our model is set up so that we're not squeezing artisans, we're not mm-hmm. squeezing factories, um, and we're not over producing. So then how, how is it possible for you to do that? Do you t- like maintain a really lean team or is there a different model that you work from? Um, we do maintain a pretty lean team. Um, that's very true. But also I don't work with factories that require that we make thousands and thousands of pieces. Mm. Um, I think it's irresponsible. We're in an age of compassion and responsibility now post COVID. And so it's really, really important Um to understand that everything that you do in business had, there's a cause and effect to it. And so, you know, we make sure that we think through everything. So factories that we work with, you know, if we think we want, we need to make a small run, we make sure that, that they're okay with that and that they understand that it comes from a place of responsibility, Mm -hmm. not a place of I'm trying to squeeze you and we pay more, right? Mm -hmm. So we might pay more, because it takes more time for them to do that than it would if to push a button and make a hundred thousand or whatever it might be. But I don't want all that, all our stuff landing in weird places in big landfills around the world. Yeah. 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 We love that. That's one thing at at B1 that we're, we're very focused on is longevity and of, of things, of things that we put on our bodies, we had a fantastic uh, fashion psychologist on uh, last year who talked about imagining the the hands, all of the hands that touched and worked on the thing that you're wearing, the garment that you're wearing, the bag, the belt, the headband, whatever it is. Imagine all of the hands and make it, um, um, it's a living thing, right? It's it's make it more personal to you and not something that you, that you throw away. Yes, I completely agree with her. And I think it's, it's fascinating to me when I come across, um, or have a conversation with somebody who's like, well, I can buy that for $15 or I can buy that for $5 on, you know, sheen, let's say, um, what they don't understand is that they're promoting slavery right? Mm-hmm. That these people aren't, that the people that are making them are not getting paid well. And they're also promoting these things that are get landing in landfills, not to mention that there's probably plastics, microplastics and whatever they're buying. <laughs> so they're rubbing the microplastics all over their body. So they're all these, you know, they're, and it's just irresponsible, right? And so you as a consumer, you as a business owner, you as, you know, just a human, it's really important that you make compassionate decisions um, yeah. for, for the earth and for all the people that have to, that are, have created what you're putting on. Yes. And that I, you I, keep for a long time. You yeah. Know? That, that you can, that you can keep. We talked, there is another, uh, one of our very early podcast guests who was based in Hawaii, who did mention, and it's the first time I heard this phrase and I mentioned it a lot on our podcast because it really stuck with me uh, in along the same vein, which is, um, you know, when you throw things away or you get rid of them, there never really is it in a way, right? It's washing up on the shores of Hawaii, for example, where she lives or, you know, Indonesia or other parts of the world, but there is no away. Um, something to think about with every purchase that we make, um, wherever it is, whether it's on Amazon or, or locally, whatever it is, um, there's a method that you purchase it, there's the production, and then there's what it is um, that, that you think about as, as a consumer. And what, what's heartening to me, for me and for the team at B1 and, and EPOP is that a lot of the shoppers that we come into contact with or who are um, coming to our, our brand, our community online is they either have 
integrated this into just it's common sense, right? It's common sense, or they're very, very interested in how they can make small step changes within their daily lives to make their lives more sustainable or reflect what they feel is is something that they should be doing, a drive, a motivation, but they they need to understand how, you know, I, I live in an apartment, I can't compost, right? Like, what can I do in my life? What changes can I make? Um, so yeah, agree. Very, very important for us as consumers, which we all are, to to keep that in mind. Speaking of COVID, what was your COVID experience, which is the first part of this question? My second part of this question is, what made you um, set up an e-commerce site so early on, um, kind of together, but because you did it early on, those two things, COVID and your e-commerce site, were far apart in, in terms of chronology. Um, so COVID, I think for me, just, and for our business, we did start making masks. Um and we took a lot of, I remember getting very frustrated at the beginning of COVID because there weren't enough masks. So we took a lot of donations and donated a lot of masks to um, hospitals around us. Um, so many hospitals around us. I can't even, and I had a lot of people calling me for their brother who was a doctor who didn't have enough masks <laughs> or their son or so that I really focused my effort during that time. Um, not, you know, our e-commerce business was still doing okay. Um, people were buying leggings and <laughs> things that, you know, like more athletic wear stuff and things like that. But I really focused our time on how can we help? We were also asked to donate leggings to the nurses in New York city. Oh, interesting. Um, by a fashion organization, I have to think of the name of it, but, um, and so we were, um, a bunch of designers from New York put together gift bags or, you know, things for them. And we put together our leggings with a QR code that went to, uh, visualization for the nurses so that they could just, check out for a little bit. So they had the, each one got a pair of leggings, but they also got this little code in there, which now comes with our leggings where you get a five minute visualization that basically teaches you the power of your mind and that you have the ability to, um, control your emotions. But, um, yeah, so maybe one pivot was that we started using that Q QR code for mm -hmm. all of our stuff and our leggings had, um, inspire they still do they have inspirational sayings on the inside so when you put them on you know you see something that says shine bright or be loving or something oh nice like i love that um so yeah and and i think the importance of covid for everybody that's left behind is the fluidity um of of your life, right? So something could happen. The rug can get pulled out from under you at any time. It doesn't matter whether it's, you know, millions of people dying or whether it's one person dying in your life or whether it's, you know, 9-11 or it could be something very simple like, you know, your, your home burning or what just happened in Maui, um, which is not simple. <laughs> But, you know, climate change, it could be, you know, there could be all kinds of different factors of things that you wouldn't expect that could create some kind of, um, you know, tension in your life. And at that time, I think it's really important for you to be fluid and kind of see where, you know, understand where your power still is and, um, you know, see where you can, you can shift. Mm. Yeah. And how do you manage to stay fluid with your business? So that's one thing that kind of, it, it's a recurring theme with our guests talking about, okay, you know, I don't know what the quote is. Six, I don't know if it's success is opportunity and preparation meeting, you know, when you have, when you can, 
when you're ready for something, but then you can also see the opportunity and take advantage of it. And a lot of really pivotal moments in all of entrepreneurs' lives, especially early on, is when they were able to, they say, okay, I've been grinding really hard. I, I'm prepared for this thing and it just happened to open the door. But staying fluid as an entrepreneur, especially in the early days, how do you manage to, to, to do this? It's easy to look, you know, when you're like, okay, I got to make payroll or, uh, you know, this this manufacturer is not doing the right thing, or it's it's easy to get lost in the minutia and the, in the details. How do you maintain that broader uh, vision, um, especially as a new entrepreneur? And how do you stay fluid? Um, so how I stay fluid is I meditate every day. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's that simple. I have a practice. I I'm I am also a certified yoga teacher. I don't teach, but I, you know, I have a practice. I practice yoga every day and I meditate every day. I meditate twice a day, every day for 20 minutes. And when you tap into meditation like that, it enables you to stay fluid and also to understand that there's something bigger than you that goes on. (laughs) And so all the minutia and all the little fear mongering things, they can just slide off your back, like water off a duck's back. You know, if someone's saying something mean about you, whatever it might be, just let it go, let it go and stay in your purpose and keep your mind clear. Wow. I've been, I, (laughs) meditation is one thing that I'm, it's always on my, you know, January 1st, list one is every year it's be nicer to my husband that's one be more patient (laughs) (laughs) you know and and dedicate real time to meditation and it's one of the hardest things I've found um for me at least it's it's one of the hardest things I've ever done is to really control my mind in a way that, that you're talking about it takes practice (laughs) <laughs> really that's all it is, is practice. And, and it's not that I don't have hard days or, or easy, you know, easier days, but it takes practice and going back over and over and over again. And, um, yeah, I, I think it promotes humility. I think it, yeah, it just takes you to, it also takes you a place of, to a place of love for everybody and everything. Um, yeah. I, and a lot of, I think if you, if you really kind of poke around a lot of people who are highly successful, have a practice <laughs> and it might be that they find playing tennis is meditative, right? It doesn't necessarily have to be what I do, but there's always something else that they do that clears their mind. And how long were you, have you been doing this for like many, many years when you were just starting the business and I'm sure it was super stressful as organic as it, as it felt, I'm sure there were some really stressful moments where you, have you been meditating for that long? I have. Yeah. Okay. I had started taking yoga long before, maybe a couple of years before that. Um, you know, it's evolved. My practice has evolved and, and as you get older, it changes. Um, but I do know that if I come back to the place of meditation, that I'll always clear my mind. Yeah. It's like, it's a little bit of a superpower because it really taps you into your intuition and your intuition is really where your power lies. I mean, everybody can give you advice and you can crunch as many numbers as you want, but oftentimes your intuition is what most of the time I would say almost every time your intuition is what actually leads you to a place of success. Yeah. We talk, I mean, in, in, Various different forms. We talk a lot with entrepreneurs about that gut feeling, intuition, tapping into it, being able to read it uh, and and feel it and figure out what it is. Um, Yeah, very important. So we always end our conversations with the same six or so questions, which are designed to be rapid fire, although it's sometimes not super rapid. So what do your plans look like for the rest of 2023? Oh, let's see. So right now we're actually launching, we're like 
adding all these new things to our site <laughs> for everybody for holiday. So that's part of the plan for the business is, um, you know, just adding some new segments and fun new products. Um, and I'm really excited to see how people react to them. We have a, a very high end coat line that's custom made, um, where you actually give us your measurements and you get this beautiful jacket or, you know, trench coat or coat made by an atelier, um, of women. So I'm excited to see, you know, how that turns out. And they're not like any other coats that are on the market, typical to us. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm really excited to see how that tests out and how that works out. And um, we're also working on a, a special media project that'll be paired with the business um, where we'll be cross-pollinating artisans from different areas around the world and talking with women like you, like high-powered women um, and creating you know, other lines. And that's just getting off the ground. It's a little scary because I don't know what I'm doing. I'm in another situation where I, I, you know, so <laughs> one foot in front of the other and, and a lot of taking advice from people. Um, yeah. And just spending time with friends and family, you know, nice. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay. What are, what about on the other side of that? What are some of the biggest challenges you see for the, for the business for the rest of 2023? I, for us, um, cross pollinating different, um, different techniques from different artisans, we, you know, we have not mastered that yet. And so that's probably our biggest challenge. It's fun though. It's very creative and, and it's really fun, but, um, you know, I'm trying to master that <laughs> for the company to get better at that. Yeah. <laughs> nice. And then just for our entrepreneurs out there. These are some big ones. Uh, in the life of your business, what would you consider to be your biggest success to date? Oh, biggest success. Wow. I think I, I view my biggest success as um, making, I don't know if it's making or enabling and empowering women to feel happy and, um, and better about themselves, whether it be through wearing things that we create or also through the process by which we create, um, you know, working with different artisans and, or, you know, I often hear from people, I just heard from a yoga teacher who put our leggings on and she said, I don't know what's in these leggings, but they really make me feel really great when I put them on and everybody asks me where I got them from. And so I love hearing those stories where, where, you know, somebody feels really happy in our stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's, that's fantastic. Yeah. That's probably the biggest success in terms of, I mean, I can talk about celebrities that have worn our stuff and I can talk about stores we've sold to and all of that. But for me, really just kind of promoting, um, happiness and, you know, um, having people feel better about themselves is, is really to me more, more of a success story than being in a big store. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Success indeed. And then the flip side to that, what would you consider over the past 20 years to be your biggest failure to date? Hmm. Right now, I feel like my biggest failure is, um, you know, I haven't mastered this cross pollination. <laughs> <laughs> so I would say that's probably my biggest, my biggest failure, or sometimes, um, you know, there were times where I felt in a little bit of imposter syndrome. Mm. So, um, maybe that, but I don't feel imposter syndrome anymore. I kind of see everything as a process. Um, yeah, I just, we have some really big goals right now and, and, uh, you know, they're not happening as fast as you always want them to. So <laughs> such is life. Yep. Such is life. As you say, this is, everything is a process of work in, in process. Yeah. It's all a process. And what about the most important lesson as an entrepreneur that you've learned to date? Um, I wrote a blog post on this a long time ago. It's not on our site anymore, but it's a spiritual journey and, I think a lot of people get into it thinking that more people are going to like them or they're going to make money or, you know, uh, none of that is true. 
<laughs> what I can tell you is true is that when you step into a position of leading and owning a business, the lessons that you're here to learn on earth, they come faster at you. Mm. You know, I've had to, you know, I had a relative one time who was interning with me show up at our offices, you know, um, inebriated. Right. And I had to let her go. It just kept happening. Right. And, and I had to have a hard conversation and this is a relative, right. So that was definitely a uh, part of my spiritual journey was understanding that I couldn't, you know, like, I can't give her special, you know, special, um, treatment over other people that worked for me. It was going to really, you know, cause a problem. And, you know, so there, sometimes there are people you have to let go because they're getting in the way, you know, those, the, those are very difficult moments. Um, you know, sometimes they're very difficult conversations you have to have, um, with, you know, people that are, that you're working with partners that you're working with that you might not normally have to, those conversations might not normally have to happen unless you had a business. So you've got to face a lot of fears through it. And so that becomes a spiritual journey. Yeah. Where, you know, each time you kind of conquer a new fear, there are more opportunities that open up definitely as you conquer your fears, but trust me. <laughs> yeah. You've, you've really got to address a lot and you learn a lot about yourself too. I mean, things get mirrored back to you that you might not like about yourself. Yeah. And you just, you learn to shift and change and become, you know, kinder or more compassionate or, you know, whatever needs to happen. It, it, you know, you take it and it happens. Yeah. That's, I've never heard it said the way that you just said it, which was the lessons that you're here to learn on earth come at you harder and faster, which is such a good description of an entrepreneurial journey. That is such a good description. And it feels often like you're learning hard lessons every day and it's emotionally draining, but the growth is so, is so steep and it's, that's, that's such a good description of it. Uh, I've never heard that. I'm going to keep that one in my pocket for sure. Oh, good. <laughs> And then if you could get 85% of the world to adopt a single behavior, what would that be? Compassion. It's really, really, really important that everybody have compassion for one another. Um, you know, I just, everybody has faults. Everybody has <laughs> um, a light side. And I think it's really important that we start to adopt compassion for one another and for different cultures and different people and people who are different, people that are having a hard time, people who have done something that you might not agree with. <laughs> you know, sometimes you do things that you don't agree with, right? Sometimes people do things that they regret. Everybody has that. And um, yeah compassion, compassion for people who don't have enough food for people who don't, you know, I really wish that the human race became more compassionate. That's a good one. And then last question, where can we find you? Where can we find all of your products in real life online? Give us a, give us a plug. Uh, at the best place to go is our website. It's hadleypollett.com. Um, yeah. And if you have any questions, there's somebody right there on the other end to answer any questions you might have. And we love doing, you know, custom work and crazy things. And, you know, so if you like the stuff that we have there, that's great. But if, if you also want to test our, our new coat <laughs> line out, that would be great too. So it just depends on what you what you want. And I, I absolutely adore it when people tag us on, you know, Instagram or Facebook, I like to see how people combine our colorful stuff with, you know, in their life, how they kind of envelop it. So, yeah. Wonderful. Okay. Hadley, thank you so much 
for stopping by. This was a great conversation. Um, yeah, so thank you for yeah. sharing the ups and downs and learnings along your your journey. Thank you. This was just really lovely. I had a really nice a really nice Friday morning with you. Good, good. And everyone else, we'll see you at, on B1.